you see the depths of my heart and love me the same. Just as I am, Father. Just as I am. I come to you and thank you for the grace that allows me to approach your throne. For the love that is undeserved. And I pray now, Father, that as we look at your holy word, I pray that you would teach us truth. Oh, Father, how we need truth in our world. How we lack it. How so many drift. Confusion. Insecurity. Thank you that time and time again we come back to your holy book and thank you for providing truth that changes us, that transforms us, and that equips us, Lord, to live lives that you've called us to live. So we thank you and we praise you for this special day. And I pray that the words of my mouth, I pray that the meditations of my heart, through your grace, would be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Some great worship today. You guys sound great. You look great. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at a couple of places today. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 is where we'll start. And you can put a bookmark there. And then turn all the way to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. So we're going to kind of look at the beginning of Matthew, the end of Matthew. And I think that in itself is going to be somewhat instructive to us as we look at God's word today. So this is a special day. We'll have some special food today and treat mom special cards. And I remember when my daughter, she's 13 now, but when she was younger, she would make coupons to give to us on Father's Day and Mother's Day. And when she was younger, those those coupons, you know, you expect to see things like clean my room and do the dishes. And her coupons were, you can play with me all day, (laughs) play a game with me. Not, not as if the whole world doesn't revolve around her or anything, right? <laughs> but, man, our whole worlds do revolve around our kids. You know, that's just a, an important part. It's what God has called us to, this season of life. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good thing. And, and many times it's a challenging thing. And we've been talking about the challenge of this thing called parenting. And this message series is called Parenting by Design. And so we're finishing up this message series. This is week five. We're finishing up the message series by talking about this key concept called empower empower and ultimately what we want to do is understand that God has has called us certainly to empower our kids to get to them to the point where they are mature and growing adults and that they can handle the responsibilities and the decisions that life will bring them as they become adults so I want us to uh, to look at this uh, passage of scripture, these passages of scripture as a template for thinking about the empowerment process and how God grows us from one point to another point. And those of you who are believers, you've been on this growth path. God took you at one certain point and he's taking you in this process to another point, ultimately on to heaven where one day you'll realize your full potential in Christ. But nonetheless, he is growing and transforming you. And there are a set of things that God does and brings our way as a way of helping us grow and mature. Well, what God does for us is what Jesus did for the disciples. And what I want to do is I want us to look at what Jesus actually did with the disciples. So Jesus began his public ministry at about the age of 30. And he spent three years with the disciples. And here in Matthew chapter 4 is the record of Jesus calling the disciples to follow him. And it says this, Matthew 4, 19. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you to become fishers of men. 
Come follow me. I will make you. That's what we want to center in. So here at the beginning, taking the disciples from point A all the way through point Z, we want to talk about, okay, here on the front end, Jesus said, come follow me, I will make you. Now, fast forward three years to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. This is at the end of Jesus' ministry, the end of his time on earth. So he, at this point, had been crucified, he had been resurrected, and now he is giving a set of last instructions, a set of last words to the disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, Jesus says this, Therefore, now go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, and it's kind of tagged on there at the end, and almost like Jesus is saying, and remember, I'm with you always even unto the very end of the age. So, here are the bookends. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he says, follow me, come and follow me, and I will make you. At the end of Jesus' ministry, he says to the disciples, now you go and make. So, here's the obvious question. What did he do to take them from that point to this point? What did Jesus do to help them develop and grow and reach their potential to the point, Matthew 28, where he would say, I am turning over the keys. I am turning the responsibility of building the kingdom and spreading the gospel. I am turning it over to you. Now you go and make disciples of all nations as I have made disciples of you. What did he do? Well, I think if you look closely at the ministry of Jesus in those three years, you'd see that Jesus brought the disciples into times and experiences where they would grow, kind of on-the-job training. Jesus equipped them. He taught them. He sat them down at times and instructed them and commanded them. Other times, he did life with them in relationship. He shared meals with them. He loved them. He supported them. He provided them the emotional resources to, to grow through this phases of development, this spiritual growth, this understanding of who he was, he provided everything that they needed to take them through these stages. And here's what I want to say to you and me as parents. Our goal is to take our kids where they are, discovering who they are and where they are, and to lead them to the next stage of their life. And to equip and to empower and to encourage them so that they will now go to that next stage in rather healthy ways and they will progress as they should from where they started to where they ultimately need to be. And our kids need to walk through a similar process of in the early years. Follow me, young heart, young mind. Listen to me and I will make you all the way to now you go and you make and you live your life as you've been taught and as you've experienced. So, Here's what I want to center in on today. There is this parent-child development. And notice what we're talking about here is the stages of parenthood. We could say the stages of childhood, but I don't want that to be the focus. Because, <laughs> you know, we all understand that children go through different stages. What we don't understand is that parents need to go through different stages. And that the way that they handle their children at one age needs to look differently than at another age. And we get into a lot of problems when we handle kids at one age in one certain way that should be the way that we handle them at another age. And we're giving them what they don't need at certain points and times and hurting them in the process of growth and stifling them from being able to be empowered to go to that next stage and to continue to grow up. So if you boil down the, the, the behaviors, if you boil down the ways that we influence our kids, it comes down to really two sets of behaviors. And I would say this, if you look closely at what Jesus did with the disciples, you could put what he did with the disciples into these two categories. Those two categories are this, are these. Supportive behaviors and directive behaviors. Now hang with me. So supportive behaviors and directive behaviors. When we're talking about supportive behaviors, we're talking about more of the emotional, relational side of things. We've talked about this in past messages. We've talked about how kids need guidance and rules and discipline, but they also need relationship. And there needs to be a balance between those two. And if, as a parent, we give one at the expense of the other, that we're hurting our kids, we're crippling our kids. 
So children receive from us supportive behaviors. They need to receive from us supportive behaviors and directive behaviors. Well, what are the supportive behaviors? Let me list a few of them for you, just as an example. And then we're going to bring this all the way back around to apply it. Here are some supportive behaviors. Listening. Praise and encouragement. Sharing of information. Sharing information about self, about the family, about decisions, sharing information. Problem solving. This is when we sit down with our children when they have an issue, they have a challenge, they have a problem of some kind, and we help them. That's a supportive behavior. We help them solve that issue. We help them work through it. Asking for input. That's a supportive behavior. Saying to them, what do you think? Sharing rationale. This is answering the question of why for them. Now, a 15-year-old is going to understand the answer to the question of why much more than a 3-year-old will. <laughs> you ever see a parent trying to tell a 3-year-old why something has to occur? And they keep going, why, 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 why? So it's pretty hard to do at that age. But nonetheless, a supportive behavior that we give is, is sharing rationale. In other words, explaining to our children why something is happening. That's a supportive behavior. Now, on the other end is directive behavior. Directive behavior. What are some of those behaviors? Establishing clear expectations. So we're setting out before our kids very clear expectations. This is what mommy and daddy expect of you. That's a directive behavior. Rules, guidelines, telling what to do. Now, that's kind of opposed to listening. This is telling. I'm telling you what to do, and I'm expecting you to do it. That's a directive behavior. Showing what to do. This is where you grab them and you sit them down and you say, here, let me show you. That's a directive behavior. I'm going to show you what to do so you can do it yourself later. Directive behavior. Setting priorities for them. This is where you come to them and say, this is what you're going to do, and this is what you're not going to do. And there, here's the deadline with it. Here are the expectations. Here are the guidelines. You must get this done by this point in time. That's setting priorities. And then finally, discipline. Discipline is a directive behavior. This is where we allow our kids to experience the consequences of their choices. That's a directive behavior that we have as parents. Now, if you were to look closely, you would say, you know, pretty much all that I do as far as a parent is either supportive behavior or directive behavior. And, and, and that undergirds that is my worship and my prayer life and my reading the Bible and all these things that go along with teaching my kids the love of God but pretty much the things that I do is either supportive in nature or directive in nature. Now, let's kind of bring it all around. And I want to share with you today, and we're going to see even from the life and ministry of Jesus, I want to share with you today a model for parental influence. And it's kind of a, an adaptation of a leadership model that I learned many, many years ago that I was trained in that I've kind of taken and adapted to the whole parenting thing. After all, we're to lead our children, right? Leadership is about influencing them for good and for God. And so this model will help us understand, well, what are the stages that each of my children need to walk through? And therefore, what are the stages that I need to walk through as a parent to help them get through these stages? Let me share with you the first stage. The first stage of parenting would be labeled the teaching phase. So we become the teacher. And for me, at least, this seems to be around zero to six years old. My primary role as a parent in that time frame with my kids is to be their teacher. Where we say this, you listen, I will teach you. Now, look at the way that the, uh, that the spectrum goes from low to high on directive behavior, right? So you look at that set of behaviors, directive behavior, we're saying, okay, during this phase of life, we need to be kind of high on the directing end of things. It's really important. Now, low support does not mean no support. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that the focus, the particular focus of our parenting in that phase of life needs to be toward teaching our kids and making sure that we are equipping them in the right way where they are getting from us the directive behaviors such as telling and showing 
and instruction and discipline. And if we will do that hard work in those first six years, that will pay dividends and rewards to come in the future. It really will. And some of you are in this phase, and it's tough. This is a tough, tough phase because you're always having to tell your kids, no, 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 don't, don't, don't. And it gets tiring. But again, remember, you're doing that to lead them to the next stage and to prepare them for that next stage. So this is highly directive, maybe lower on the supportive end, but highly directive. That needs to be my particular focus. Make sure I achieve that. Next phase is the phase that I would call coach. Coach. This is the ages of our children between 7 and 12 years old. And this is a really, really fun stage. This was probably my, my funnest stage, you know, with respect to my kids. Particularly my boys. Because it was this, it was this stage where they, you know, 8, 9 years old, where they were, like, they, were on, they were like sponges. And they, at that point in time, they really looked up to dad. <laughs> you know, I wasn't Ward Cleaver back then. I was... You know, I was somebody that they really liked to hang out with and learn from, and so it was camping, and it was basketball, and it was fishing, and it was this thing of coaching them, which I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed, and they were very receptive to it at that age. This is an important stage, all right? It's a time where we say, you watch, I'll show you. Now, on the supportive directive scale, what is it? It's highly directive and highly supportive. This is kind of the full court press. This is a pivotal stage in the life of a child, isn't it? This is where we need to bring high direction and high support. And you look at those two sets of behaviors and we say, really, this is a full court press where we need to give as much as, of both of these as possible in this coaching stage. Because it only lasts for a little while where kids are willing to be influenced by mom and dad in that coaching stage. You watch, I'll show you. And they are receptive to it. It's a wonderful time. Third stage is the stage that I would call mentor. Now notice we've tipped over from highly directive to now highly supportive and low direction. This is the ages between 13 and 20. And, and remember, there's always exceptions to these rules. This is not legalism. This is a way of kind of thinking about you know, what works at a certain time frame. So when they become teenagers, all the way through, you know, sophomore, junior year of college or so, we should shift our focus. We should begin to transition in those early teenage years to now where we come to allow them to make decisions and to allow them to live with the consequences of those decisions where we now move toward more supportive behaviors. And we, t we come from being a teacher to a coach to now being a mentor where we say to them in incremental ways, you do it, I'll advise you. I'm here for you, I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm still around, there's still accountability, it's, I'm not just cutting you loose, that's not what we're talking about. But we want to get our kids to the point where they will begin kind of doing things and then living with the choices that they've made and to understand what it means to be accountable and responsible. This is where in those middle teenage years where maybe they begin to have their first employment opportunity. They begin to work and make a little money for it. Those kinds of things. So what are they doing now? They're becoming pre-adults. And in that pre-adult stage, what we need to do is kind of push them out and say, Listen, you do it. What do you think you should do? I'm not going to tell you what to do. What do you think you should do? And what would be the results of you doing it that way? And to become a mentor to them in this key phase. So we're moving from teaching them and telling them and showing them to now advising them, being a mentor. And then fourth, and finally, is the friend stage. The friend stage. It doesn't mean you're no longer their parent. Please hear me. But what I'm hoping will take place and what I'm seeing with our older child in particular is that we have a different relationship and it is an enjoyable time where we have adult conversations and you know it's still in progress 
It's not over. I'm not saying that. He's not a full adult, but we have different kinds of conversations now, different advice that I can give him, and it's really cool, and it's helpful for me to see him as a young adult who needs to be living life pretty much on his own, and very soon on his own. This is where we say to him, you go for it, I'll cheer you. You go for it, I'll cheer you. This is that 21 and above kind of thing. This is where a lot of parents tell me it gets really fun to be a parent. <laughs> You're, you get them out of the house. You get to date your spouse again. You actually eat a meal without any kind of emergency of some kind. You have a little bit more money in the bank, those kinds of things. And so it's a fun stage. But now you become a supporter primarily of them rather than a teacher directing them, telling them what to do. You're now advising them and being a friend that they can come to time and time and time again. Now, here's the key for you and me. What happens to a child, or what happens to the parent-child relationship when I have a five-year-old that I try to be best friends with? It doesn't work. I had one lady come to me after the service and said, I wish I'd had this 30 years ago. She said, I was trying to be a friend to my little kids, and it destroyed them. She said, I needed more directive behavior with my children. That's what happens. You try to be a friend to a five-year-old. You try to share rationale with a five-year-old. You try to listen to a five-year-old. Well, what do you really think? <laughs> well, they don't know what to think. Come on, let's be honest. We need to equip them, we need to help them, but we need to, they need us to tell them and to show them more. And this is not being dictatorial, I'm not talking about this. This is not being overly uh, authoritarian. But what I am talking about is being a leader to our kids. That's what they need. They need discipline. They need showing. They need telling. And if I'm a loving parent, I will give to my kids what they need, not what I'm comfortable giving. Now, what happens now to a 21-year-old or a 22- or a 23-year-old where you try to be the primary teacher? <laughs> you try to tell them what to do, and you try to, you know, say, sit down. It just, you're treating a 22-year-old like a 5-year-old, and that gets you into trouble. You treat a 5-year-old like a 22-year-old, that gets you in trouble. Here's the genius of God growing our kids in a certain way. And it's really cool how God did it. I think about this often because each stage of my children's lives is so much fun. And there are challenges that are associated with it. And there are joys and successes that are associated with each one of these stages. But I look at them and I go, I don't really want them to grow up. You know, I wish they could stay right here where they are. But then they, you know, it's this pain of them growing up. And then they get to that next stage and I go, well, this stage is really fun too. I like this a lot. This is kind of fun. You know, I don't want them to grow up. And they get to the next stage and the next stage. And it's all good and it's all fun. But I have to be mature as a parent to know the difference in treating my child at 5 years old as compared to 25 and being willing to be used by the Lord to play a role in their life that is key, that is important for that certain time frame. Now, let's bring it all kind of home to roost. So you look at this chart. And you see this bell curve, the way that this works. Look, follow me. I will make you very directive. Follow me. I will teach you. I will instruct you. I will provide an example for you. I will make you all the way through teaching, coaching, mentoring, to friend, to now, I'm cutting you loose. Now you go and make. You live the life that God has called you to live. You be the person that God wants you to be. And this is what you need to say also. Those of you who are empty nesters, you've said this to your kids time and time again. And lo, I'm with you always even to the end. As long as God has me here on this earth, I'm still your mom, I'm still your dad, I'm here when you need me. I'm here to give you advice. I had a man tell me after the service, he's about 70 years old, he said his, his 38-year-old daughter asked him to go and help him pick out a car yesterday at the car lot. 
He said, it made me feel so good that she's still turning to me for advice, for wisdom in making decisions. That's the way it works. And that's the blessing that comes. Going all the way from, I'll make you, to now, you go and make. Each one of these phases being blessed of God, each one of these phases being special, each one of these phases, from the time you hold them in, their arm, in your arms for the very first time, to that first day when they pack up their little lunchbox. Remember lunch boxes? I see, I see sacks now. I used to have lunch boxes with Batman on them. Those were the good days. And you march them off to kindergarten. They walk into that school and they say goodbye. It's a special time. That first trophy, that first medal they win, that first achievement they have, that first date they go out on, graduating from high school, graduating from college, getting married, having kids. What a joy. Is there anything better in life? Just about nothing better in life. And we get to be a part of it. Each one of those phases are special. Let's be sure that we do what we need to do. That we man up, that we woman up, that we do what we need to do in that stage and give to our kids what they need. Not necessarily what they will always want. And not necessarily what we will always be comfortable giving. But give them what they need so that they will be equipped that they will be encouraged, that they will be, what? Empowered to become adults that live fulfilling lives. And there are challenges associated with each stage, and there are rewards, and there are blessings. And I just want to remind you this, moms, each stage um, should be cherished. I know it's when you've got a two-year-old or a three-year-old, you're saying, cherished, survive. Each stage, (laughs) each stage should be cherished. Don't skip through it, not looking back and having precious memories, snapshots in the album of your mind that you look back and you say, I remember that, I remember that, I remember that. And it was special and it was challenging, but I cherish it. And I'm glad that God has moved them to the next stage and so on and so forth. I was there. I was present. I was what they needed. And I did the hard work. Irma Bombeck, some of you remember Irma Bombeck. She's a writer. This is what she said. She said, raising kids is like flying a kite. Running along with it, trying to get it off the ground. And just when you get it off the ground, it crashes. And you have to patch it up. And you spend your life trying to get it to soar. And then all of a sudden, one day comes when the wind catches it and it soars. And you keep letting out the string. And then you realize that your job is done and that you must let go. It's tough to let go. But it's what God has called you to. Empowering kids to be what God wants them to be on loan from him to you just a short time just a season of your life to equip to empower to encourage them to be what God wants them to be so let's give it our best effort okay let's stand for closing prayer and we're done for today just invite you to uh bow your head and bow your heart and the most important thing that I could share with you as a pastor and as a parent is for you to remember that Jesus is always there and you can always turn to him on your worst days as a parent when you've blown it when you're frustrated, when you're tired. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. 
And maybe this morning you just need to come to Jesus. Let me just give you a moment to pray, to talk to your Father in Heaven who loves you so much, who provides for you everything that you need, to pray and talk to Him as you seek His will and strength for your life. Father, thank you for the wisdom that comes from your word. Thank you, Father, for not only the knowledge, but thank you, Lord, for the strength, the emotional and the spiritual resources that are needed for us to be what you've called us to be. And I pray for these families. I pray for single moms who are doing it on their own. God, provide for them everything they